I don't know about you, but like my aunt always says, I'm happy, glad to be in the house of the Lord today. You know, I'm happy that uh, I'm not restricted and, and, and held back and not able to get to where I need to get to. How many of you know that there are some people that didn't get out their bed this morning? Amen. And it's not because they didn't want to. <laughs> It's not because they, they didn't want to get up. It's because they were unable to and their bodies didn't allow them to. So the fact that you're here is a miracle. The fact that you just took the last breath that you just took, that's a miracle. You, you serve a miracle working God and, and, and it shows ever present every time your heart beats. <laughs> every time your body works the way God designed your body to work without you even thinking about it. How much of a blessing is that to know that today? And so uh, we're... we're Super glad and super excited that God is in this place and he's working and we do have a word from the Lord today. If you could turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Job. Job chapter one and we're going to start with the 13th verse. Job chapter one. And if you are able to, if you could stand with me for the reading of the word. Praise God. Job chapter 1 in the 13th verse, and it reads, One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Bad news back to back. But it didn't end there. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels, and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. You would think it couldn't get any worse than that. All of his possessions were gone at that point in time. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly... A mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are all dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with these wrongdoings. Before you have your seat, I want you to find one person and, and give them this reassurance. Tell them there can be calm, can be calm. In, your calamity. in your calamity. Oh, I need you to say it to one more person and say it like you mean it. There can be calm. In your, calamity. in your calamity. Praise God. You may have your seats in the presence of God. 2020 has been a year for the history books. <laughs> I tell you, at the beginning of 2020, nobody could have ever envisioned the type of things that we would be going through. It's unlike what any of us have, or well, most of us have ever experienced in our entire lives. It's completely foreign from what we would ever have expected to see. And I really feel bad already for the kids that are going to be in history class in a few years and have to study on 2020 because they're going to be studying for a long time trying to break down exactly what went on during this year. And it would be one thing if we were only having to deal with one major problem that approached us and there was only one crisis that happened to fall upon us because with this one thing coming down against you, it seems like it's easier to remain hopeful because you can look at the other situations that's going on in your life and say, well, it may be bad in my finances, but at least my marriage is doing good. Or it, it, it may be bad in my friendships and my relationships, but at least my job is going good. 
But what happens when the amalgamation of a global pandemic, these deep rooted issues of racial discrimination, joblessness, homelessness, financial ruin, all these things strike at the same time. And we ain't even forgot about the murder hornets they were telling us about not too long ago. <laughs> All these things coming and presenting themselves at the same time. What do we do when disaster begins to accumulate faster than glory begins to come? What do we do in our lives when we're dealing with these things piling up on top of each other? What do we do in this time? I, I, I know we would be okay if, if I only had to deal with my financial problems. I, I, I'd be okay if all I had to deal with was, uh, was my relationship every now and then having issues. But when it all happens at the same time, what do I do? I want you to know today and understand this fact that while all this may be going on, that the fact of the matter is God is still sovereign. While all these issues may be occurring, as we used to sing every Sunday, God is in control. Sovereignty simply means that it is supreme or ultimate power. That means God has power over everything that's taking place and occurring. That means that I can rely on him in the midst of any circumstance because he is the ultimate author. He is the ultimate one who is in control. So when I'm suffering or when I'm going through these things, I can rely and remember his sovereignty. When I'm dealing with pain and hurt and heartache, I can rely on his sovereignty that he can carry me through. You see, Job was a very wealthy man. He was very wealthy. He was blessed. He had 10 kids. He had thousands of sheep and thousands of camel and thousands of oxen and had everything that he could ever want in his lifetime. And not only was he rich, but he was upright and blameless. How do we know that Job was upright and blameless? God himself said that Job was upright and blameless. I don't think you need anybody else to vouch for him because God said he was blameless. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Yet, when Satan was looking for somebody to torment, God suggested that he try Job. Have you considered my son Job? Can you believe that in the midst of doing right in his life and living a good life, that God said, I'll allow you, the Satan, to come after him. And what this shows is, is that immediately that God may not be the cause of it, but whatever comes into our life, God allows it. Right. <laughs> I know that's hard for some of you to stomach because you say, how could God allow for somebody to get sick from this virus? How could God allow for, for something to happen badly to me in my life when I did nothing but live upright for him? God's sovereignty allows his authority to be exercised in a way that may change us for the better, even though we didn't know how something good was going to come out of that situation. Because God is sovereign, he's, he's aware of the attacks of the enemy. The devil ain't got nothing past God without him knowing what's going on. Satan has no authority outside of what God has given. So regardless of what's happening in your life, it didn't make it past the, the view of God. God is aware and he sees you. In fact, if you're his child, he calls you his friend and you're concerned about the affairs of your friend. You, you don't just bypass and see what's going on with your friend and turn, or turn the other cheek and turn the other way and not look at them and see what's going on. You, you pay attention to what's going on with your friend. So under the full attack of Satan, one by one, Job's possessions were taken away and it happened in rapid succession. He didn't, if one bad news came and before that bad news had finished, there was somebody else coming with even more bad news. It was rapid and it was instant that all these things were going down. And under the full weight of this pain, under the full weight of all these things that were going on and losing in his life, he had grief. Job had grief that was strong, but he also had a praise that matched that grief. In the midst of that chaos going on, his praise and his grief coincided right there together. He acknowledged the power of God. He acknowledged that everything he had was because of God and from God. Right in the midst of getting the worst news that he could have ever gotten in his life. But under the full weight of those things, he acknowledged the power of God and gave him praise in that time. So today I, I, I want to give you a few truths 
that you can remember when tragedy comes knocking on your front door. Some truths that you can use to have peace in the midst of pain. That, that, that you can have calm in the midst of your calamity. One, the first thing I want you guys to, to pay attention to is that good behavior does not absolve you from suffering. I know that's tough to, to hear, but good behavior does not absolve you from dealing with suffering. In fact, in Job's case, it made him a target. <laughs> because he had done right in the eyes of the Lord, it opened up the doorway for him to be tested. Because he had done what was right, God saw this as an opportunity to show off. And I think everyone is well aware that if we behave bad, from the time we're in elementary school, we're taught if we behave badly, that there are negative consequences associated with that. And, and if we're good, then we'll see the good. But unfortunately, our behavior does not prevent us from experiencing hardships. It's not our behavior that, that, experience, uh, that absolves us from all hardships that we're dealing with. If, if it was based on behavior, if our outcome was only based on behavior, then we wouldn't have a need for a savior. If it was only about what we did, then, then, then we wouldn't have any need for, for a blameless sacrifice in Jesus to come through for us. We just behave right and everything will be right for us, right? So it's beyond just our behavior. And, and, and even if we had the best behavior, the Bible makes it clear that all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So even if you behave the best you ever could behave, you were born in to this sin nature. And even if you came through and had the greatest behavior and, 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 and did everything your mother told you to do, even when you're young and, and you behaved in school, the, the only person to come through this world that was completely sinless was still subject to suffering. Jesus Christ came and lived a completely sinless life, did nothing wrong at all, spoke only his father's word, but yet was still subjected to suffering in the end for the greater good of you and me. You see, we may not understand why we have to go through these things. Jesus had a full and clear understanding of his suffering that he dealt with. But what you can know is that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. If you are living and walking in his purpose for your life, then the suffering is secondary to the glory that God will receive when you're walking in his purpose. Throughout the book of Job, there, there are many discussions that, that, that Job and his friends have regarding his behavior. They, they come to him and, and we already know from the beginning that God has said that, that he's blameless. But yet they believe that the reason everything is going bad because he's being punished because of his behavior. That he needs to repent. That he needs to go to God and, 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 and make restitution for the things that he messed up in. But how can we reconcile somebody being blameless and still dealing with these things? Because blameless does not equal sinless. Job was still born into a world that was fallen. Just because he was doing the right things did not mean that he wasn't exposed to that sin virus that was given in the Garden of Eden. So it's good. It was good that he was blameless. God looked upon that as, as, as favorable and he used him as an opportunity to, to show his goodness. But yet and still suffering approached him. Not not it's not. By our actions is what I want you to understand. It's not how, how good you are or how bad you are. The thing that sustains you and carries you through is the grace of God that is provided to you in your life. The grace of the sovereign Lord is the only thing that is sustaining you and giving you what you have. The Lord giveth and the Lord taken away, not by your actions, but by his grace. His grace is the only thing that can sustain you. The, the, the rain doesn't come down and dodge those people that do good. When the rain falls from the sky, it, it, just because you're living right, it, it, it's not going to miss you. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. Because we're in this world, suffering will hit you if you're just or if you're unjust. It's just a simple fact of that. We've all been dealing with what's been going on the past few months, and, and, and we weren't absolved from it because we were Christians. We weren't absolved from it because we prayed every day that, that, that it was still taking place around us and it was going on and it was affecting things that we deal with on a daily basis. The, the rain falls on the just 
and the unjust. Job said, I came into this world naked and, I, and I'm going to leave the same way with nothing. I can't take it with me. I can't leave this earth with me. We should honor God in the way that we behave. I'm not telling you that uh, there's, because uh, you'll still be subjected to suffering that you should just act any way you want to. I'm not, I'm not telling you to go out and wild out because I'm going to still have to deal with suffering anyway. We should honor God in the way that, that we behave and in, in, in the way that we deal with things because at the very end of the day, Jesus told us in John 16 and 33 that in this world you will have tribulation. But take heart because I have overcome the world. I have overcome these things. And, and so we need to be strong and realize that we have hope. And, and we, can, we can live in a way that's uplifting despite the circumstances that are attacking us and the things that we're dealing with because we have hope that our Savior has overcome every single thing in this world. We're not living like those who are hopeless and, and don't have the knowledge and, and have something good to look forward to. We know that our Savior has overcome this world. And it, it's not a requirement for us to understand what's going on and why God is doing these things for us to continue following in faith. It's not a requirement for us to know exactly what God's plan is for us to continue moving in an attitude of faith, acknowledging where he's taking us. Second thing I want you guys to know is that God is entitled to unconditional praise. God is entitled to unconditional praise. In verse 20, verse 20 says that Job tore his clothes and cut his hair. At this Job got up and tore his robe and he shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship. Even in his grief, even in what he was feeling, that heaviness, that weight of all that loss, that he praised the God of the universe. Yes, yes. That he took time to fall on his face before God and worship him because of who he is. Even in our grief, we got to acknowledge who God is. Even in our down times, when we enjoy uh, the, our victories, whatever our greatest victory is in our life, we can praise God. But whatever our most immense tragedy that we deal with in our lives, we owe God that praise. Yes. Unconditionally, yes. we owe God yes. our praise. Yes. Because, see, what praise does is it, it acknowledges that God has inherent glory. It, it, it acknowledges that he's inherently good. That there's that, that means that he he has always been good and always will be good. It's just his nature. It's just who he is. We, we, we worship because that removes that attention from ourselves and begins to place it where it belongs on a God who is worthy despite whatever circumstance is going on. I, I, I'll change. Things will go bad in my life and my mood will change and my mood will shift, but my God stays the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And if I can rely on that, I can praise that, and it won't. it's not subject to what's going on. Regardless of our circumstance, God's glory is unaffected. God's glory isn't changed by what we're going through. And, and, and God isn't better because we're comfortable. God isn't more glorious because we're in a good space. God isn't better because things are going well in our life. Just the same way that God isn't worse because we're going through something bad in our life. God maintains his intrinsic goodness. Uh, help me with this. God is good all the time. And all the time. God is good. Let's say that one more time. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Now, see, I know that's a churchism, and it, and it sounds good when it rings off of our tongues. And, and we really, but if we really understood what that meant, that God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, that there's no time where his goodness isn't apparent and showing in our life, if we understood that our circumstances didn't affect the goodness of God, if we understood that if we're up high or we're down low, God remains the same and that's good, we would praise him wherever we are and whatever circumstance we're in because he really that his goodness will bring us through it's okay for for us to express grief it's okay jo job tore his robe and and and, and he uh could shave his head and, and and he showed that he had grief but we have to remember that we're not hopeless even though we're heartbroken we, we have to remember that there's still something on the other side of this that can bring us closer to our savior we know that he is good God doesn't deny us from experiencing our emotions or from being able to, to grieve. The, the Bible says that there's a time for everything. 
And, and so God doesn't say you can't grieve because I'm good. God doesn't say you can't express your emotions because I'm good. God doesn't say any of these things. We're able to express these emotions, but we cannot forget that he is good in the midst of our tragedies. Yes, yes, we can't yes. believe, we can't start to believe that, that God is less than somehow because we're not comfortable the way we want to be. We, we can't start to believe that, that God isn't still moving and working the way that he's always worked because I don't have that, that, that calmness that I want in my life. Finally, I want you to acknowledge this, that comfort is found by trusting in the authority of God. There's a, a certain comfort that comes when we trust and believe in the sovereignty of the God that we serve. Throughout the book of Job, we, we see that he's searching for comfort in this time of loss. He had lost his possessions. He lost all his family. He, he lost his health. He was down, so downtrodden. And then when his friends came around and tried to offer him some support, they did a terrible job at doing that. It was completely awful what they came in and they came and pointed the finger at him and told him how bad he was. Now, they, they told him, you need to repent, you need to get right. And they're telling him how bad he was. And the fact of the matter is they didn't have any evidence of it. They didn't have any evidence. I mean, if he lived a blameless life, he, he was uh, basically the priest of his kids. He would do have sacrifices for them and make sure they was clean. So he, he covered his family. He covered himself. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Yet when, when something went wrong, they pointed the finger at him and told him how bad he was and how he needed to get right. Even though this was baseless, you have to be incredibly careful from who you're taking your advice from. You have to be very careful in those circumstances that are difficult because people will quickly point the finger at something that doesn't even exist. You have to make sure that you're focused on the God. That's why we spend time in praise. That's why we spend time worshiping so that we can get the fullness of what God is trying to speak to us at that time and not be impeded by what's around it. If we magnify the Lord, then his words will be greater than anybody else that says something around it. And so his friends put that out there and God finally gave Job an opportunity to understand what he was going through. God came to him and he began to speak to him and remind him that the only comfort you'll receive is right in my presence. Why is that? He began to ask Job a series of questions over multiple chapters. And he asked Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Where were you when I set everything in motion? And he reminded him over and over through each example that only a true and sovereign and a just God could place these things the way they are. And so Job remembered that he had God in his corner. Job was able to look and see that the one who had created the earth was on his side. And if that God was on his side, no amount of loss, no amount of situations and circumstances against him would be able to hold him down because the God who created the world as we know it is in my corner. There's no better comfort that I can feel than knowing that God is on my side. There's no better uh, way that I can make it out of this thing besides focusing on the fact that God be for me, so who could be against me? He was, he was so comfortable in trusting God that even in that uncomfortable situation that he remained in at that time, he was able to say something that was very profound. Job goes on to say that I'm comforted in sackcloth and ashes. Now, the thing about sackcloth and ashes was when, when they were mourning, when they were going through times of, of sadness, to express their sadness, they would put on these itchy clothes called sackcloth. And they would put it on, and, and, and it was to show an outward appearance that I'm mourning on the inside, or and that I'm going through something on the inside. And I want y'all all to see what I'm going through. And they, they, they sprinkle ashes on their head, and, and, and they, they make themselves as low as dust. And, and, and they go around and they show outwardly how bad they feel. Well, sometimes... There are certain clothes that I won't wear that are made to be worn that I don't want to wear because it's uncomfortable. I didn't put on a little weight here recently, and sometimes when the clothes is too tight, it don't feel right. <laughs> and yet 
He said, in these most uncomfortable clothes that I can put on to show my outward expression, even though I'm hurting on the inside, I have comfort in this time. In this clothing of sackcloth and ashes, in this time of mourning and loss, in this time of not having what I thought I should have, in this time of being set back, in this time of being hurt, in this time of being pressed down, I have comfort. Yes. Don't you know that there is no situation that you can go through that can stop you from having the comfort of your father near you? There is no disease or, or matter of, of health issues or anything that can stop you from having comfort when you are in the presence of an almighty God. When he's in your corner, you can be comforted in sackcloth and ashes. Even with this outward expression of grief and even in this time of not knowing why, he still could trust God when he put God into perspective, when he magnified the name of the Lord, when he understood exactly what this God did, he knew that he could do it in a greater way in his life. We all will have times of grief and suffering. We are not absolved from this. Jesus said it plainly. But if we would trust that God is not going to leave us in these times, that he isn't going to allow these things to pass through him, and then just take off and leave without us, then we'll be able to stand firm and be comforted and have calm in the midst of this calamity. We have to remember that the world is subject. The world is subject and under the ruling authority of God. That he set the stars in motion and he is still in control to this day. And if we would acknowledge that in everything that we go through, it would make us be able to cling to the fact that he is for us, that he is on our side, that he's in our corner. And if we know that, then nothing that comes against us will scare us or keep us down forever. After Job had this realization of who God was, Job prayed, and, and, and after he prayed, he was given twice as much as he had had before. It wasn't enough for God to just restore what he had. But God said, for what you've gone through and, and for what you've shown and, and for now what you realize, twice is the only thing that's adequate enough for you and your household. We may not ever understand what we're facing because Job never got privy to that conversation that we saw at the beginning. Job didn't know that, that, that God had offered him up to be uh, tested by the devil. Job never figured that out, even after he received double at the end. But what he did realize, he didn't get the why, but he knew that God was the one that gave him the grace to have what he had. He knew that God was the one that provided for him in the first place. He knew that God was the one that would carry him out and take him to a higher level. And so he knew that the world that he lived in was subject to the authority of God. We may not understand why we're dealing with traumatic situations. We may not always get why we have to go through the things that we go through. But one thing we can be sure is that God's sovereignty remains in the midst of our chaotic situations. That God still remains sovereign. And knowing that, we can clearly see that he's going to provide us with comfort and the grace to preserve through anything that may come our way. His grace is sufficient for you and for me. So even though we still feel the sting of this pain, even though there's still heartache that we're dealing with, yet no matter what, he's given us what we need to not only sustain, but he can remind us daily of his power and majesty. What I want to do now is pray. And pray, I want you to search your heart. And say, is there any area where I haven't fully trusted God? Is there any place inside of me that I'm not allowing myself to remember that God is sovereign? Take this time and, and give it away to him. Lord God, our Father, we just thank you in this time, Father, because we know that you are the supreme ruler of this world. That you are sovereign and that you are caring for us, Lord. You are our covering, Lord. You are our peace. We thank you for that in this time, Father. We bless your holy name. 
in this day, Lord, we pray that we would just give up anything that is not in line with our thoughts for you, Father. Let us give up anything that does not reflect who you are in our life. Take us and carry us through, Lord, and remind us daily of who you are. We thank you and give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right now, before we end, I want to give you an opportunity to make one of the greatest decisions you could ever make in your life. I want to give you a chance to accept Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Or if you've ever accepted him and you may have fallen away and say, today is the day that I want to get back right in standing with God. If that's you today, as we all bow our heads once more, I want you to just shoot your hand in the air. Even if you're watching from home, put your hand in the air right now as a sign of agreement of confirmation that you want to accept Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Or you are you ready to come back to God? You're ready to come back to him. Right now, this is for you. I want us to all say this prayer for the benefit of those that may be watching. Say, Lord Jesus, I pray today that you would forgive me of my sins. I believe you are the son of God. And I thank you for dying for my sins. If you prayed that simple prayer, you are now a child of God. And all of heaven is rejoicing and excited for what you, the decision that you have made. We thank you and ask that you would just continue to grow stronger in the Lord by reading the word of God and by going to him in prayer. You may not know how to pray, but I promise you, if you would just begin to speak to God, he would be able to hear your heart and know exactly what you need.